Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanjit Mitra. I'm a scientist here, and I uh, chair the uh, science popularization and outreach programs at IUCA. So we are near the end of the 2015 Science Day celebrations here. Uh, so according to the current count, almost 7,000 people visited us today, which is remarkable. <laughs> So, you know that, uh, of course you know because that's why you are here, here, that uh, uh, every year we have a lecture on uh, uh, previous year's Nobel Prize winning work. Okay? And uh, Professor Arnav Bhattacharya from TIFR is going to give that lecture today. So Arnav did his uh, B.Tech from IIT Bombay uh, and then he went to different countries uh, for to get his PhD from uh, he got his PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison and uh, then he went to uh, Germany for a while then he came back to India and set up a lab in TIFR uh, his lab is uh, got uh, awards uh, for example in uh, uh, 2009 I think you uh, uh, got the award from Indian uh, 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 Semiconductor Associations award uh, and then he's, uh, he has written some 70, uh, co-authored 70 papers, he is in boards of different journals, etc., etc., which you are probably are not interested in. But what is more interesting is that he is very uh, enthusiastic <coughs> about taking uh, science to people. So he organizes something called uh, Chai and Why, you might have heard about it if you are in, uh, from Bombay, uh, where many people <coughs> can come and interact with uh, scientists and ask their questions, okay, which is a great thing. And he's actually organizing uh, one tomorrow morning. So we are really thankful to him. In spite of his busy schedule, he could come here and <coughs> give this lecture today. Okay? So, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to thank Ayuka for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share some of uh, some interesting stories with you. Uh, when Paddy called me up and said that you have to do it, it's very difficult to say no. So he kept insisting that I do it and I'm, I'm glad I'm here. Uh, so if you've read the title, it's a little provocative. It says it's seeking enlightenment. And I'm sure you must be wondering, what is this guy going to be talking about? So let me first put things absolutely straight. If this is what you've come for, wrong place. <laughs> Okay. The enlightenment that we are going to be talking about is N for nitrogen. We are discussing semiconductor materials which have nitrogen in it called the nitride semiconductors, in particular gallium nitride and its friends. These materials are extremely important because they allow you to make very efficient light emitting devices. And the 2014 Nobel Prize went to these three gentlemen, Akasaki, Amano and Nakamura, and the citation for the Nobel Prize says, for the invention of efficient blue light emitting diodes, which has enabled bright and energy saving white light sources. So as you see, there are going to be two colors today, blue and white. And we're going to be talking about light emitting diodes. And as somebody has very thankfully, Sami has put up these nice Diwali lights over here. I think uh, by now, all of you have seen light emitting diodes somewhere or the other. Uh, I've stopped carrying them with me because there's invariably something that thing tells me there's a green LED there. My laptop has an orange LED telling me the charger is on, things like this. So LEDs have been around for a long time as indicators. If you look around any room, there are lots of these LEDs somewhere glowing, indicating that something is on or something is powered in some state. There have been indicators. What has happened is, over the last 20 years, they have become extremely bright and so bright that they can now be illuminators. We can use them to light up the world and that is what the story is going to be all about. So, this is actually a wonderful time to be talking about LEDs and light because 2015 is the United Nations International Year of Light. So, it's really nice that we talk about, talk about light. Today in particular, it's even nicer because the National Science Day in India, today, uh, which is Friday 28, is the day when Raman supposedly, you know, discovered the Raman effect 
you know, he noticed it, observed it, and made observations of it in his journals for the first time. And Ravel, of course, led the stage for doing a lot of very, very important experiments with light. So light and Raman, of course, is a nice starting point. Raman was also a very good teacher. By the way, this is a great day to be celebrating. Uh, it is Teacher's Day in most of the Middle East. 11 countries celebrate Teacher's Day today. If not, if this is not good enough, there are lots of reasons to celebrate today. In fact, a lot of cool people have birthdays today. I think a lot of people were in a, in a hurry to get born on February 28th so that they didn't get on to February 29th and then uh, have a problem of uh, you know missing their birthday so often. So let's see who all you, if you know, we celebrate their birthdays today. There is Lewis Powell, uh, the only person who's won a single Nobel Prize, unshared Nobel Prize in two categories, founder of quantum chemistry, you know, in molecular biology. There's Peter Melabar, who uh, gave us theory of why transplants get reject rejected, grafts. So transplant medicine, Nobel Prize in 1960, so this is 1901 born, 1915 born. Leon Cooper, who gave us the Cooper pairs of superconductivity, not Sheldon Cooper by the way, Leon <laughs> uh, he got the Nobel Prize in physics in 1972. It's a long list by the way. There's Dan Sui, 1939, who got the Nobel Prize for the fractional quantum Hall effect. There's Stephen Chu, uh, also the energy secretary in the US for a while. He did laser cooling of atoms in the bose einstein condensate, for which he got the Nobel Prize in 1997. It's also the anniversary of another set of Nobel laureates. There's Charles Nicole, a very old guy, Nobel Prize in 1928. He figured out that uh, uh, typhus, the disease, was carried by lice. Uh, Owen Chamberlain is anti-protons. He died in uh, 2006, 28 February, Nobel Prize. And Donald, Donald Glazer, who was the bubble chamber and allowed cosmic rays to be discovered, is uh, or track is uh, 1960 Nobel Prize. In Ayutthaya, you should actually be celebrating someone else as well. Uh, this is a <coughs> clockmaker and a mathematician called Jost Burgi. He was Swiss, and of course, he worked later on in the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, whatever it was at that time. Way back, born in 1552, he came up with two very, very vi vital uh, inventions. Uh, these are parts of making a watch. It's something called the cross speed escapement. This is a mechanism that is like a ratchet which allows you to go tick, tick, tick actually. And he also invented something, this gravity. You've seen old pen, these clocks which had this weight to, to wind the spring up. So these things, uh, he actually, his clocks give a two orders of magnitude improvement in accuracy. And because of that, uh, a certain gentleman by the name of Kepler thought that he was good enough to get his, this clock would be used for timings and this is how in, in Europe a lot of the accurate timing measurements first got taken and Kepler, you know, of course, did a lot of useful things at those times. Um, and he was also a good mathematician and way before he uh, didn't publish things very much, so we don't know much about him. But uh, in 1620, uh, this is the first page of arithmetic and geometric progressions in which he comes up with the idea of logarithms, uh, way before Napier. Uh, so if you like the problem things, clocks, etc., this is the guy you should celebrate. Okay, let's get back to this. So we're going to be talking stories. We're going to be, I'm going to tell you stories of, of course, the Nobel Prize and the science that goes on to, uh, behind it. But after all, the Nobel Prize is given to people. And I'm going to be telling you stories of the scientists. Okay? Um, so if you are a physicist by chance, if you, you, know, you might find that the physics is really, really, really dumbed down and simplified because I want to get the big picture across. So please excuse me if the physics is not you know, up to the mark. So the light that we're going to be talking about is artificial light. Artificial light is a very important part of our life today because it allows you to do two things. It of course allows you to extend the hours of daylight. Without artificial light, you're sort of limited to sunrise to sunset. You don't know what to do at night. The other thing which is perhaps more important today is it allows you to use internal spaces like this. You could not use an auditorium like this unless you had artificial light. And most of our homes and kitchens and bathrooms, and if you see the design of modern homes, without artificial light, it is very, very difficult to use. So it's an in integral part of our lifestyle today. And I'm going to turn this off. This is very irritating. Oh, no, that just changes the flash pattern. Okay, um, so in the last 200 years, we have been able to make artificial light in many ways with increasing efficiency, right? From candles to oil lamps to tube lights to whatever, incandescent bulbs, tube lights, etc., um, way up to LEDs, and that is a remarkable story. Okay, 
these LEDs, of course, apart from being illuminating in here, they're everywhere. In fact, recently, uh, Mumbai changed the illumination of the Gateway of India. Uh, it's now lit up by LEDs of different colors, and depending on the uh, mood of the month or whatever, they, they light it up in, in different colors. Uh, most of the monuments are getting lit by LEDs these days. Uh, our new airport, uh, which was launched some time back, has about five kilometers of wall lighting, which is entirely white LEDs. Okay. So LEDs are, are starting already to find their ways in, in commercial lighting. Uh, LEDs can also lead you into controversies. Uh, this is Tuesday's newspaper in Mumbai. Uh, uh, we have the Marine Drive in Mumbai, which was, uh, which was, which was a fused Queen's necklace. And now after ruining its golden glow, the BJP now does something else. So the whole idea is that earlier the Queen's necklace had sodium vapor lamps and it was a golden colored necklace. And the city is very upset that they've been replaced by LED lights, which are white lights, and it's no longer a golden colored necklace. So uh, this is currently page one of the Mumbai Mirror, uh, which is a very interesting publication, which should be read sometime. Uh, and uh, uh, so you can see LEDs managed to get to the front page in more ways than one. So these LEDs, which you have seen, I mean, they used to be these tiny little devices which put out uh, you know, red, blue, green light. For many, many years, for many years, most of the indicators were orange, yellow, or green, or red. Blue was not available. The key thing was to get blue. Because once you get blue, you could make white light. Now, you can think of making white light by taking red plus blue plus green. I'll show you a demo of this in a minute. But this is not, however, how it is done for the white LEDs. I will tell you about that later. <coughs> So LEDs are good for various things. Traffic lights, a big thing for white LEDs, the first big market was mobile phones. Backlighting, not the smartphones, even before that, your Google Nokia phones were, were illuminated by a backlight. Of course, street lamps, uh, your Diwali kind of lighting, they are bright enough to be car headlamps. In many countries, they are already acceptable as car headlamps. In many countries, rules don't allow it to be used, but still they are used for sort of decorative lighting around the headlamp, etc. So uh, LEDs have gotten very bright. All these, all these LEDs are based on these semiconductors containing nitrogen. So that's going to be the, the, the key material of today's story. So let's meet the Nobel laureates. Let's meet them. Now there are three of them, but I will discuss them in a group of two and one. So the group of two is Akasaki and Amano. Akasaki is sort of the grand old man of semiconductors in Japan. He is 85 years old. Amano was his undergraduate student, master's student, PhD student. When Amaro did the work for the Nobel Prize, he started off as a undergrad project. That is the project that started off which became the Nobel Prize winning work. Of course, he continued with it. So uh, Akasaki, he got his PhD from uh, Kyoto and Nagoya in, in 1964. He worked in industry for a very brief bit, moved back to uh, Nagoya University as a professor. He was there, he did all this work mostly over in, in Nagoya, the, the Nobel Prize winning work. In recognition of his contributions, uh, he was offered a, a center and a big directorship of a, a nitride center at Maijo University. So he moved there in 1992 and he's still over there. Amano, of course, got his PhD under Akasaki in 1989. He stayed there for a while until his professor moved. When he moved, even Amano moved with him to Maijo University. And now he got a full professorship some time back and moved back to Nahoya University. These two guys are perfect Japanese academics, uh, very respected people in their field. Uh, they are academics. Right? The, uh, so you can see over there. The other person is Shuji Nakamura. Nakamura is 60 years old now. And I have a picture. Yes, I do. It's one of the rare pictures that you will find of Nakamura like this. Uh, when he got his, he did all his work, he did not have a PhD degree. He only had a master's in engineering from a small university called Tokushima University. And he spent most, I mean, all his work was done at a small company called Nichia Chemical Company. And this is an amazing story. Okay. Uh, eventually, of course, once he had shown the world all these LEDs and lasers, he was given a Doctor of Engineering. In 1999, after working for 20 years in Nichia, he moved to the US and moved to uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara. And this is another amazing story. Now, this is not the picture of Nakamura. If you can Google, go to Google and say Google images for Nakamura, this is not what you will find. The kind of pictures for Nakamura you will find are more like this. He is a showman. He likes to show his stuff. Or like this. <laughs> okay, all like this. <laughs> so as you can see, in terms of personalities, they are very different people. Amano and Akasaki, 
and Nakamura. And their stories are also very different. In fact, there is a book written about Nakamura. It's called Brilliant. It's about the blue LED that you see over here. So, Shuji Nakamura. And the IEEE, which is a respectable learned society, has a summary of the book. And the summary of the book reads like this. Bright lights, piles of cash, courtroom drama, and a lone inventor. So, as you see, this is a perfect Hindi movie story. Okay. So, we will tell you the story in a little bit. In a little bit. Wait for a while. Okay. So, first we need to figure out how did these light emitting diodes go from being indicators to being illuminators. How did they get so bright? And I don't know your background. I assume this is public. So, I need to tell you what an LED is and how it works in a very, very simple, simple manner. Now, a LED typically, if you look at this, if you look at any of these little things that were glowing over here, uh, you'll see such a piece of plastic with two little wires coming out of it. And if you look very carefully inside it, you'll see a tiny piece of golden colored something inside there. That's the little chip that emits the light. Okay? Now, as the name says, it's a diode. A diode is something that allows current to pass in one direction. And we need to see how you get light out. Okay? So, the basic diode. <coughs> Semiconductors are materials uh, on which the world of electronics is based. So all your radios, TVs, mobile phones, you know, whatever. These are all based on semiconductors, mostly on silicon. You must have heard of Silicon Valley and the Silicon Revolution and everything else. Silicon is great, but silicon doesn't emit light. So we need to look at other materials. But the first thing you can do with just a block of semiconductor is not very useful until you can make two types of semiconductors which are traditionally called p-type and n-type for positive and negative and it just depends on how many electrons are there in these materials which are sort of free to move around. In the n-type one there are lots of them, in the p-type one there are actually very very few of them. In fact, uh, it's almost like they have a deficit of electrons. Okay, and we call them, they, they behave as if they are positively charged. They are not really positively charged, they behave as if, it's easier to think of it that way. And the, the simplest thing you can do is bring a piece of P and N together and you form the basic device called a diode. And uh, the beauty about the diode is if you connect a battery such as the positive is to P and negative is to N, you can get current flowing. Whereas if you connect the battery the other way around, no current flow. So it's like a one-way switch for, for, for electric current. Now it so happens that in some materials, in some materials, you can get light out of these diodes. But first, let's understand how does anything put light? How do you get light at all? Any light, whether it's light from this lamp, light from the projector, light from my, you know, this little laser, anything. How does anything put out light? Well, there's only one way in which you can get light. The only way you can get light is you take electrons, give them some energy, send them to an excited energy state. After some time, they'll come down. They'll emit the excess energy they have as light if you can get things proper. So. Anything that emits light, you've got to somehow get el take electrons, give them energy, and wait for them to come back. That's how you get light. So what happens in a, so in, in a fire, you're providing it by heat. Uh, you know, there are different ways of doing this. What happens in an LED? In an LED, when you put it to connect the wires the correct way, P to, to positive, etc., a current flows in this. Now it turns out that the energy of the electrons in the N and the ones in the P are slightly different. So when the current goes through, these positive and negative charges are, are, are at different energies and you know electrons are lazy people. They always like to go to the lowest energy state possible. So the electron likes to go to the lower energy state and it releases the excess energy it has as light in some materials. You've got to get the materials. So that's how the, the material emits light. So essentially in this little thing you have a p-type and an n-type semiconductor. It will pass a current and at this junction light is emitted. That's it. Now these little things which were so small, we put, they took milliwatts of power, they put out very few lumens of light. Lumen is a unit of light. I know it makes no sense. I will give you a demo of what lumens mean. Uh, these things over the years have increased. Now you get big chips which put out, take watts of power and put out, put out you know, hundreds of lumens of light. Okay, so how did all this happen? And the progress has been just dramatic. If you look at the last 100 year or so years, this is how many lumens you get for a watt of electrical power that you put in. So this is lumens per watt. The bulb, the incandescent lamp, the good old electric bulb, hasn't moved very far from when it was invented. It was you know, maybe 10 lumens per watt, and it's about you know, not done very much. Even the halogen lamp hasn't improved it by very much. The tube light is a huge improvement. Tube light goes to almost 100 lumens per watt, which is very good. 
It's probably the best you know, value for money source that you have today. Sodium vapor lamps, the yellow lamps used for street lighting, they are of course very efficient. They're almost at 150 lumens a watt. However, they're not white light. It's only one color, yellow color, which is not, you can't do everything with just yellow light. You need white light. The LED starts off to being commercially available only around 1996, but the progress is phenomenal. Look at the slope of this curve versus any of these. And very soon it crossed 150 lumens per watt, making it, you know, better than anything commercially available. And in the lab, at the end of the year when the Nobel Prize was awarded, the record now is above 300 lumens of watt. So on this scale, it's somewhere up there. Right? 300 lumens of watt is what you get. Now I understand that uh, this is a little difficult to imagine, but let me just say this for a while. There is one more thing. As they have gotten brighter, they have also gotten cheaper. And just like there is a very famous Moore's law in the semiconductor world for computing, saying that the number of transistors you can put on a chip doubles every so many years, well, the amount of light that you can get out of an LED goes up by a factor 20 every 10 years, and the cost comes down by a factor 10 every 10 years. Except that it's still too expensive to compete with mass light uh, applications for light. Okay. So now uh, you must see what you mean by 100 lumens and all this stuff. So it is time to uh, do this. So the first thing I said is uh, LED is something where you take a piece of semiconductor, uh, you have two clients, P and M, you connect the battery the right way and light comes out. And this is essentially what the guys who got the Nobel Prize demonstrated for gallium nitride. And today it is something which pretty much anybody can make in the lab. So I'm going to take a risk and try this. If it doesn't work, I have a video. Uh, Alright, so what I have, you see much better over there, but maybe you'll see in this as well. I have a battery with the red and black are the positive and the negative. I have a piece of semiconductor where we grew, this is something grown in our lab. Uh, there is N and P and let's see how this works. That should be negative. Now you just you know why Indian gods always should have more hands. <laughs> Yeah, maybe if you catch this, this might be <coughs> Okay, so just catch that. Uh, hold it, just hold it vertically. It's fine, hold it. So that's N, that's T, Okay, do you see it's growing blue? Yeah. Okay, so this is a blue LED. This is the same structure which has got the Nobel Prize, which we made in our lab uh, some time back, just for fun. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll just show you the video, it's easier. Yeah, so there is a piece of semiconductor that I'm putting. It's the same thing which is in the box over there. Uh, we take a battery, connect two wires, uh, and if you get the direction right, there it glows blue. Uh, it's actually so bright that it's, uh, the camera sees it as white. This is what it is. This is a, a blue LED. Of course, that's not very bright. That's absolutely not very bright. Well, that's the wrong one. Uh, let's go ahead. So how do you make white light? Now, the simplest way you can make white light the simplest way you can make white light is by combining the primary colors which are red, blue and green. And if this thing is supposed to work well, so this, this. Yep. okay. So Ashok here from Ayuka's outreach thing has provided me with a red, blue and a green. Uh, and if we just illuminate it this way. Okay, so you can see that if I have red, blue and green, in the center they combine to form white. Okay. Also, please do notice that green plus red gives you yellow. Okay? Green plus red gives you yellow. Alright. That's what we wanted to show you. That's good enough. Let's do this out. Okay, great. Now, the easiest way to do it would actually have been to take red plus blue plus green and mix it to get white. Now, the reason we don't do that is because we want to sell LEDs. And the guys making it want to sell LEDs, not us. If you did this, you would require a red LED, a blue LED and a green LED. You would require three LEDs. You would require three current supplies for that. And they would degrade at different rates. So you would keep balancing and tweaking the uh, current to each of them. So this is a very expensive way of making white light. Though it would be very nice. It would be the best way to get white light. What we do is, we use the fact that blue plus yellow. So if, remember, red plus green will give me yellow. So if I mix blue plus yellow, I also get white. So what you do is you start with just a blue LED. And in the plastic, in the plastic covering of the blue LED, you embed some molecules which are called phosphors, which absorb blue light, which has a higher energy than yellow light, and re-emit it as yellow. Some of it. So you have the original blue, 
you don't take all the blue and convert it to yellow. You convert some of it to yellow such that the blue plus yellow looks like white. And all your white LEDs, your things look like that. And as you can see, most of the LEDs which were which were the indicator types are not very bright. But if you look at the current white LEDs, as you can see, this is a completely different level of brightness. Right? This is effectively a 20 watt street light. Okay. So these, this is what is uh, the capability. And if you look at it carefully, it's actually yellowish in color. Uh, it's got a little red on it because I dropped it on a carpet once. That's a different story. Uh, okay. So that is it. Now the question is, how do we make it? What do we do with it? Let's keep going ahead. Why is this important? Remember, one of the things in Nobel's will for the awarding the prizes is that they have to be something which benefits mankind at large. And I think this white LED can actually change the world. And this is why. This is a very famous picture of the Earth at night. It shows this is pictures taken from satellites telling you where light is going off to space. So it is actually wasted light because it's all going up to space. As you can see, some places are very bright. That's North America there, Europe, Japan, even India is actually quite bright. Of course, the Amazon rainforest is dark because nobody lives there. But look at the continent of Africa. It's still pretty dark, though people live there. There are still lots of places in the world where people live and they do not have access to light. And light correlates with development. Let's zoom into India. So this is Mumbai, this is India at night in a larger scale. Uh, this is Mumbai, Pune, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Delhi, Kolkata, etc. You can see, you can see there are still regions of India where there are no, there is, you know, you can always correlate lack of development with lack of light. This is a, you know, all your problems are often because there is not enough infrastructure and not enough light. Now. Traditionally, our, our paradigm has been we build a thousand megawatt power plant somewhere, transport that electricity most inefficiently, st steal part of it on the way, and lay a line to the last village and hope that for a few hours a person out there will get power. The LED has an ability to change that. Why? Because the LED is a low voltage device. It requires only a few volts to turn it on. The solar cell generates low voltage electricity. If you want to run tube lights and everything else with a solar cell, you need an inverter. If you want to run an LED, you can do it without the inverter. Because you don't need to step up to AC. Okay. And LED based lamps can change the world, the light and lighting. And there are many, I'm just, I'm, this is, I'm not advertising anybody, a random website uh, to show you that there are lots of people who are combining the LED and the solar cell to provide grid independent illumination to uh, rural areas. And this can do what the mobile phone did for India. You are not dependent on somebody to lay a wire to your house. You put up a solar cell and of course you need a battery, which is probably the, the, the weakest link in this whole thing is the battery. But the solar cell plus LED can light up the world. Uh, there are people in India doing it as well. This is Selco. Uh, the other thing is, the LED, the way the LED light is, allows you to think of solutions in a completely different way. The only way we have been illuminating our world is we put lights on the top and the ceiling and illuminate the whole room and then do some work over there. But if all I'm doing is reading a book, I don't need to illuminate the whole room. So here are people doing some sewing, right? They have LEDs mounted right near where they need the light. So you can do with a one watt LED. You don't need to illuminate the whole room. So it gives you different ways of thinking about light. Uh, this is pictures from Assam. This is a hospital where these big lights, they need big lights because you don't want shadows. Right? You'll be cut up, you better not have shadows. <laughs> <laughs> now you can replace this with a head mounted light. You can replace it with a head mounted light. These can be charged by uh, cycling for a while. This is a 15 liter uh, tail cutting in a Naga generating some micro hydro. You can use this to run a uh, LED light. This, I think, is the biggest thing for the LED. It has the ability to change the way we look at light. Okay. Of course, apart from that, there are good science reasons as well. I mean, they have a long life. See, a bulb does not tell you I am going to fuse tomorrow. It generally just goes off without letting you know. An LED will lose its light gradually over a period of about seven or ten years. You can replace it in a planned way. You can turn it on and off very quickly. You can. It's not. Most bulbs tube lights everything. If you notice, the time they die is when you typically switch them on or off. That's the weak point. That's where there's a current surge. An LED, it, it's not dependent on switching the light panel. You can get them in different colors, environmental friendliness. Out here, you take a tube light and you're done with it, you throw it. 
In the West, the cost of disposing a tube light is more than the cost of the tube light because there are traces of mercury in it. Okay, so this is this is really good. However, however, let me tell you, science is not what drives technology all the time or the adoption of a technology. It's cost. There's only one thing which is the cost of light. I can give you an extremely efficient product, but if it's not cheap enough, you will not use it. Okay, and at the end of it, there are a few minutes left. I have some very interesting statistics on economics of lighting. It's not just the cost of the LED it's, or the electricity that you save by using an LED. It's a total system cost that you need to worry about uh, over the entire lifespan. And there are some very, very interesting statistics that you know make it appear that it's not such an easy solution. Finally, of course, it's economics that decides things, not necessarily science. Okay, so that's the sort of background. After the lengthy introduction, let's get to the heart of the problem. Why can't you make it? Why is it Nobel Prize winning hard? And what was happening all this time? Now remember, I said at some point that silicon is a semiconductor that we are not used to. And silicon, if you remember this periodic table, it sits somewhere here. Okay? And silicon doesn't emit light. So what do I do? I can make some kind of artificial material in the lab which resembles silicon. How do I do it? I take one element from here and one element from here. One, so silicon is group 4. I take one from group 3 and group, one from group 5 and I make what is called a compound semiconductor. So if I take an atom of gallium and an atom of arsenic, the structure is very similar to silicon or germanium. I can take gallium and phosphorus, gallium and nitrogen, aluminum and arsenic, indium and antimony, or whatever, you know. I can make mixtures of these. And the beauty is, all of these mixtures are different semiconductors and they all emit light of different color relating to something called the band cap, that's the technical word. <coughs> but it's not that I have just five elements here and five elements here and I have to pick from there and choose. The good thing is, I can make khichdi with elements. <laughs> okay? And that's what I do for a living. How do you make khichdi? You take rice and dal. That's your basic thing. And then you add spices to change the flavor of your khichdi. You can add more mirchi, less mirchi, more salt, less salt. It will change the taste. I start off with gallium and nitrogen. That emits light at a certain wavelength. If I want to push it towards the green, I add a little bit of indium. If I want to push it towards the ultraviolet, I add a little bit of aluminum. Similarly, if you start with indium, indium and phosphorus, add a little arsenic to it, add a little aluminum to it, add something to it. So you start off with some basic material and add small amounts of other elements and change the color. So in a kitchen you change the taste, here you change the band gap and hence you change the color. That's what I do. Okay? And over the last 50 years, we have learned how to grow these materials with atomic level precision. I can put down one layer of gallium atoms, one layer of nitrogen atoms, another layer of gallium atoms. I have that much control in making these materials today. Okay. By the way, these materials have been known for a very, very long time. They are not new materials that were suddenly discovered. Sommerfeld, one of the great physicists in the 1920s, uh, in, this is German, of course. When he was coming up with the idea of there could be materials which are semiconductors, of course, his first choice was diamond. This is like carbon. But he said that there could be other materials which you know were tetrahedrally bonded, and his first choice is aluminum nitride over there. Okay, this is 1926, science for physics. If you look at a textbook on chemistry of the 1930s, this is Miller's Inorganic Chemistry 1930s. It tells you that you can do an experiment with alumina and carbon, and you heat it up and Modern safety rules will never allow you to do this in a college lab anymore. Uh, but there are fun experiments where you make something white hot and you open it up and you know let the atmosphere react with it, and you get crystals of aluminum nitride, etc. Gallium nitride has been somehow extremely difficult. In 1932, it says that a nitride of each member of group 3 is known with the exception of gallium. Somehow there's a problem in getting gallium nitride. Okay, story pauses there. Let's look at semiconductors and light from it. This is so two parallel tracks. One is materials, one is devices. So in the early 1900s, it's the days of radio. Radio transmission across the world is, is, is developing. And in those days, there are no semiconductors and no diodes. But you still need a rectifier. You need this one-way current flowing to make a radio receiver as well. And what JC Bose has, had invented was something called a point contact rectifier. You took a piece of semiconductor, you took a sharp wire and you stuck it on it and it behaved like a diode. Okay. So, many people are working on this. JC Bose unfortunately is working with lead sulfide, Galena as a semiconductor. And Galena we know today, if it emits light, it would have been in the infrared, he wouldn't have seen it. But there are other people. So, you know Marconi is one of the pioneers of radio. Marconi has an assistant. His name is Henry Round and 
he writes a letter to Electrical World. Uh, this is not a journal publication, it's like a letter to the editor of one of these trade journals saying that I am working with silicon carbide, carbonandum, and when he works with these what are called catch viscous detectors, same thing, wire on, on the thing, you see a yellowish light fish. And he also notices that yeah, it depends on the voltage, so he's seeing some sort of a diode like character, but he didn't. It's like a letter to the editor. But he notices this in 1907. The person who really figures out what's happening and works out the whole thing to death is unfortunately forgotten in the pages of history. This is a Russian guy by the name of Oleg Losev. He is also a radio technician. He comes by this thing. He is in the Nizhny Novgorod radio laboratory where he is also working on radio receivers. He is working on the same point contact uh, devices. Now this guy is unfortunately not a scientist. In fact, he's in the in the sort of caste system in there, there are academicians and there are scientists and he is a poor technician. Okay, He has no formal education. However, he published 43 papers and was given 16 patents and in the semiconductor world he did lots of things. The first amplifier and a lot of different things. Luckily for him, he would have been completely forgotten. But in those days, the guru of science in Russia, a guy called Abraham Yoff, notices him and asks him, why don't you come to my institute? So he comes to the Yoff Institute in 1929. He is just so proactive over there that in 1938 they decide to give him a PhD without a thesis. I mean, are you coming? This would never happen. <laughs> I either it, yeah. So, uh, what does he do between 1924 and 1941? He figures out how light comes out from these materials. He looks at zinc, silicon carbide, zinc oxide. He even has an idea he can use a light source here in a detector somewhere else and have optical communication between them. Comes up with relays, etc. This is his first data, cargo random on silicon carbide. And he says in his journal, beginning from this point, luminescence is observed. So, we can see light and you can see this is very much like a, like a, almost like a diode curve. The sad part of the story is, this poor guy is forgotten because he died of starvation in the Second World War during the siege of Leningrad and when they found him and his notebooks in his lab, he was working on something called a three-terminal semiconductor amplifier. For those who know this, this is nothing but a transistor. He was 10 years before Bardeen and company. But we don't know, but then this is unfinished work, we don't know whether he actually realized that this is a transistor and you know what the transistor actually does. But anyway, that's what he was working off. Amazing guy, unfortunately forgotten. Now, Bardi himself never made, uh, never got into LEDs. But Bardi's first PhD student is a guy called Nick Holomia, who worked in, after finishing his PhD, worked in the General Electric's lab, GE lab in Syracuse. And he worked in, uh, in materials like gallium arsenide phosphide. Gallium arsenide phosphide is all the materials of, the, of these red LEDs. So these small red LEDs which are indicators, well, this is the guy who invented them. GE sold its first red LED in 1962 for $262. If you look at it in today's prices, you could buy a car for that. Right? It's a small this little, little LED which was not even so bright. Okay. Horomi has of course received a lot more fame because he also invented the semiconductor laser, the red laser. The one you see in the barcode scanners and laser pointers, that's also this guy. So he received a lot of fame in this. He worked for many years in industry, then he moved, uh, he went to uh, uh, Illinois. He worked for almost 40 years in academia, a uh, hugely successful person, very well recognized. Uh, however, in any Nobel Prize, there's somebody who has to say that, hey, I should have got it. And he made no bones about it. He said, hell, I'm an old guy now, but I find this one insulting. Okay. Uh, and he also has a book about him. It's called The Bright Stuff, about the LEDs. So he thinks that the red LED uh, should have, as an inventor of the red LED, he deserved the Nobel. It came before the blue. But I think you can, you, you know, you can see that the red LED, which is an indicator, and this are completely different things in terms of changing the world. So I think I'm quite happy with the Nobel Prize. Uh, what's the problem in the material? What's the problem in the material is that you need to deposit some it on something. You, you can synthesize a new material, but uh, when you synthesize a new material, you have to deposit it on something. So when you are learning about semiconductors, the first thing you do is you have a world map. You need to make these materials. You need a world map, and this is your world map. What is the world? This is when I was studying as a student. This is the world map we had. It said this was the color of light, the wavelength of light. This is all the band gap energy, and this is the spacing between the atoms in those materials. Okay. And if I want to deposit a material, I need to deposit it on something, and it has better have a similar size of atoms because. I want the material that I'm depositing to hold hands to form bonds with whatever it's on. Okay. And all these materials that we knew, 
If you look at the energy, they are all microns, so the visible range starts here, 7.7 7 to 0.4, all these are in the infrared. There is nothing in the visible. So, very soon these nitride materials came up. Now, the earlier graph I showed you is this small corner here. Aluminum nitride is all the way in the ultraviolet. Indium nitride is in the infrared. Gallium nitride is just at the edge of the violet over here. These materials can cover the entire visible range. The problem is, unlike this, gallium arsenide, I take gallium, I take arsenide, put it in a tube, heat it up, you get gallium arsenide. I can use it as a substrate. There is no <coughs> gallium nitride substrate. Right? What do you deposit it on? And that has been a problem. And that is why for many years nothing happened. The first breakthrough comes in 1969. Now I am going to show you the first pages of papers. I don't expect you to read it. The reason for doing it is I want you to notice the journals you are in. There is no nature, or science, all this stuff. Please read letters, nothing of that sort. These are all in very, very applied journals where, you know, small time, I mean, in those days, none of these guys thought about impact factors and, and, and things like this. Anyway, so what happened in 1969? Again, this is the Radio Corporation of America, History of Radio. They are working on uh, Manuska and PKM. What they figure out is <coughs> a new method of growing these materials. A new crystal growth method and they figure out a something on which they can grow it. It's not perfect, but still they said, let's use sapphire. Why sapphire? Because gallium nitride, if you look at the, the unit cell, the crystal structure, it's a hexagon. It's a hexagonal unit cell. Sapphire is also a hexagonal material. And they said, maybe this hexagon will fit on each other somehow. Let's try growing it on sapphire. That was the first time they were able to get reasonable quality, at least you can grow it. Okay? And they grew it from a vapor. They did not grow it by starting with individual elements, but they had gases which contained these elements reacting together to form this material. I will tell you details about this later. So, they are growing it from a gas, from a vapor, and they are growing it on sapphire. Still, sapphire is not the same size, so it is very difficult to grow. What are the problems? Well, there is no substrate. Uh, so materials are grown in sapphire, there are lots of defects, lots of defects, lots of cracks in the material. It's you know it can't be used for making light. The other big problem, of course, you need to grow it very hot and it's very hard to work with it, etc. It cannot be made free time. The first thing I need to do in a semiconductor is to make a diode. If I have only n time, it's not good enough. I need to make p. I can't get p time. So lots of defects, can't get p time, forget the LED. It's not gonna happen. And this is the problem. People say, forget gallium nitride, let's work on zinc selenide. Zinc selenide is another one of those combinations you can make. Zinc selenide works very well. It emits green light, but it dies in a few hours. Until today, nobody's figured out why, why that happens. Okay. And people were really struggling with this. They had almost, most of the world had given up on gallium nitride, except for Akasaki's group. Akasaki's group is a, is a classic story of people struggling with a problem for 15 years or 20 years and not giving up on it and, 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 and you know finally figuring out how to do it. Akasaki had tried the same method that Maruska and company, the earlier paper I showed you were using. He started off and he saw that paper. He, he When he drew it, he says that you know the most of the material is junk. But in the middle, once in a while when I looked at it in the microscope, I could see tiny crystals which were nearly perfect. The question is, how can I get that perfect crystal across the whole thing? Large size. He stuck with the problem. And in 1985, they found it. They found a solution. This is a paper in applied physics letters. Metal organic vapor phase hepatitis growth. Again, some way of growing it from vapor for high quality gallium nitride using aluminum nitride buffer. The idea is don't grow directly on sapphire. Okay? Use something in the middle, a buffer, which is not good quality. See, remember, everybody is aiming for perfection. This guy says, no, don't do it and try to get it very good. Grow something bad initially and then grow the gallium nitrate on it. This sort of bad quality layer does something, which I'll come to later, and this allows you to sort of mitigate the difference between this uh, silicon, I'm uh, sorry, the sapphire and this, and this layer. Okay, so that's what he did. And he's able to grow the first films. Now, the next thing that happens, happens by mistake. By chance he figures out how to make it p-time. He was like any good material scientist looking at this thing in a microscope, in an electron microscope. 
and he figured out that where all the samples he had looked at in an electron microscope were p type. So he figured out by by irradiating it with electrons by lowering the electron beam irradiation, I could make it p type. Once you have p type, once you have good material, you can make a p-n junction, you can make a diode, and that enabled them to make the first LED, the first blue LED uh, with the p-n junction of Kasaki and Amani. This is again Japanese Journal of Applied Physics, a very small one. So he can make it p type. Then comes Nakamura. Nakamura comes in in 1980, just just 1991, and he says, "Look, I don't even need to grow gallium uh, this aluminum nitride. I can just grow bad quality gallium nitride buffer layer and work on this. Much simpler. I don't need two materials. And this is what we do. The sample I showed you. I have, by the way, later on, if you'd like to look, I have sapphire. The sapphire that people start off with." Sapphire, uh, I have gallium nitride on sapphire, smooth films, you can see that they are shiny and depending on what you change, so just, you know, as I said, gallium nitride, the band gap is in the ultraviolet so you can't see it, it's transparent, indium nitride looks black because the band gap is in the uh, infrared so it absorbs visible light and I have something which is yellow, I can, you know, I can, I can make my khichdi, I've got samples of khichdi. Okay, now the next thing is, oh by the way, this paper, this paper has only four references. All are Akasaki and Amani. These were the only guys in the world who knew how to do it. <laughs> okay. So this is what we do. This is what we do in our lab every day. You initially start off with sapphire. You grow a very thin layer, 20 nanometers. It's not even crystalline. It's so bad it's amorphous and at a low temperature. And then you heat that. When you heat it up, what happens is some of these materials, bad quality material evaporates, some of them recrystallize into tiny, tiny nuclei. And then you start growth again. And the growth is no longer happening on sapphire, it's happening on these tiny perfect crystals of gallium nitride. You do it in a way that you can spread these crystals sort of horizontally, you get a smooth film and then you start growing and this is what we do. This is the, what the trick that Nakamura and, and uh, they taught us. This is what we do. The next thing is, he figures out how to dope it p-type in a very easy manner. He says, look, I don't need, he figured out why, what the electron beam was doing. The electron beam was just heating up the sapphire. That's all it was doing, it was locally heating it up. So he said, hey, I will just heat it up in, uh, thermally. I heat it at 900 and 700 degrees, it becomes p-type. This is now an industrially scalable process. You can't take an electron beam and scan it. You can do it for a one millimeter sample. You can't do it for large wafers. Now you have an industrially competitive way of making large area p-type samples. Now you have LED industry that's going to come in. And in that same, same year, 1992, he worked out how to, uh, why it was happening, why it was happening. Okay, so he figured out you can make it p-type by heating it and he figured out why it became p-type. The third thing he did, again 1992, within the year, same year, three papers, is he figured out how to make indium gallium nitride, essentially khichdi. If I add indium, so this is it, I'm starting at 400 nanometers. If I add indium, I can change the wavelength, I can change the color. So he's figured out a reliable way of, of changing the color. So now he can make blue-green LEDs, he has p-type, he, he has good quality gallium nitride. Nichia becomes a company that goes from a no-name company to a $200 million company in two years. Okay, so you can make alloys and change the color. Now, this is a science story. This is not, this was not Hindi movie masala. So where is the masala? Well, that is in the story of Shuji Nakamura. Now, this is a fantastic story. This is just so fantastic that it's almost unbelievable that it can happen. Nichia is a very small company. It's a very small company founded by 1956 by Ogawa, Nobu Ogawa. It's a family owned, very, very chota company. It used to make some chemicals like calcium chloride. In the 1970s, Color TV came up. If you remember the good old, at least my generation, all Sony, Panasonic, in the 1970s, these were the color TVs were a rage. Color TVs needed phosphors, and Nichia decided to make phosphors. Phosphors are these things on the screen that will glow red, blue, green. Okay. 1979, Nakamura joins Nichia. He is their one man RD department. The first guy hired to do RD. And why did he join Nichia? Well, he had offers from big Japanese giants like Kayosera and all. Well, because he was from Tokushima, his wife was from Shikokyu, wife didn't want to leave, wife is the hidden heroine of the story. <laughs> he decides that I will be with my wife and join a company which is where my wife is going to be. So, he joins this very small company called Nichia in 1979. Now, in the mid-1980s, Nakamura is at that time a 30-year-old engineer. He has no publications. Please remember this, he has no publications. Uh, they tried to give him work on developing two products. Both of those products couldn't be sold. 
So then his boss says, why don't you make gallium phosphide? Gallium phosphide is a material that you emit in the red. So why don't you make gallium phosphide crystals? And this is what he has to say. So we'll hear it in his own words. He says, at least once a month, an explosion occurred in my laboratory. Every time the whole room shook and filled with smoke from burning phosphorus. Quartz pieces would fly around in the air. The sound of explosions became a famous ritual of the company. <laughs> so clearly this guy is not doing very well in his R&D department. <laughs> so what does he do? He goes to his boss. And what does he say? He says, listen, I don't want to work on gallium phosphide. I want to work on gallium nitride. Give me three million dollars and give me one year holiday. <laughs> and the boss grants it to him. This would have never happened anywhere else in the world. In any industrial R&D setup in the US, if it was Bell Labs or anything like that, the manager would have killed this program. <laughs> right? An academic place that we have, we would not hire anybody without publications. Right? We don't know what went in Ogawa's mind to say, to take this gamble and say, okay, fine, go to the US, learn an OVP, and come back $3 million for you. So the real hero, Ogawa. Okay? Hang on, hang on, picture of you be back. <laughs> so, this guy goes to Florida. He learns conventional and OVP. Nobody knows MOVP of Gallium United apart from Akasaki and Amano. He learns this, he figures if I know what the basics are, I'll do it. He comes back, designs his own reactor. He claims he had a better reactor design. Then within, within a few years, he figures out this gallium nitride buffer, he figures out the p-doping, he figures out the alloys, etc. and he does it. In 1994, the first blue LED comes out of Nichia, and in 1996, the laser comes out of Nichia. And the world is no longer the same. Nichia becomes a world leader in gallium nitride. Within, within, within a few Five years or something, they become a billion dollar company from some family owned business. But, as I said, picture Baki. Nakamura has gone to the US and after coming back, he's very unhappy with the Japanese corporate environment, though they gave him this holiday and three million dollars. <laughs> and remember, there are these two guys in Japan, two groups in Japan. The US and Europe have spent billions of dollars on gallium nitride and they can't get it to work. So, what do you think happens? The University of Santa Barbara in California, they invite him over. So Nakamura leaves Nichia and goes to Santa Barbara in 1999. And Nichia says, hey, listen, you can't go there and tell them what we are doing over here. Right? Uh, not to work on the LED stuff being done here. Well, Nakamura doesn't sign on sign that. On the other hand, he goes and starts consulting for Nichia's competitor Cree. And Nichia decides to sue him for breach of secrets. In 2001, he says, no, nope, I'm going to sue you, 20 billion yen, I want almost 20 million dollars. Why? Because, hey, I gave you this blue LED and made you this company that you are, and how much did you give me? Well, I got 20,000 yen reward, 180 dollar inventor reward, everything else belongs to company. He says, no, nope, I want my share, which is 200 million dollars. This becomes a major, major fight in Japanese intellectual property law. And very, very surprising for Japan, the courts rule in favor of Nakamura. Okay? Nakamura wins this. Eventually, of course, there is some appealing, etc. He settles for about $8 million or something. But this became such a famous case. You know, I think the world wouldn't have known about blue LEDs if it was you know, not for this sort of... This is a very nice story. And look at this guy. In 10 years, he had nothing. From nothing, from zero, he goes to 90 patents. 200 plus publications, 5 of these publications have more than 2,000 citations and 20 plus awards. I mean, he had almost every award from the, you know, IEEE awards, Millennium Technology Medal and finally this year the Nobel Prize, of course. Okay. So, Nakamura went really, you know, from, to a, became a, a major hero. So, let me summarize where we are right now. I mean, <coughs> most of the growth problems, all these problems in growth, today you can solve them. Today you can, you know, buy a, a machine from a, a vendor, they'll sell you a machine that you can sort of plug in and grow these materials. It's not that easy. But, so white LEDs, because of the lighting uh, and the blue lasers, blue lasers are useful for Blu ray discs and, you know, many other things. Uh, they have really pushed the, the science of this material. However, let me warn you that blue is good, green is not. We don't know how to make very efficient green LEDs. Kichidi is not so easy. You add indium, efficiency drops dramatically. You add aluminium, efficiency drops dramatically. We need good UV LEDs. The UV LED will again revolutionize the world. High power UV LEDs. Why? 
because you can use it for water purification. Right now you depend on an aqua guard. Your aqua guard is a mercury tube. You can replace that with a tiny LED. You can fit an LED on every tap. Right? As far as the science goes, we don't understand why these materials work. I'll just put it in short. There are lots of problems, there are defects, they still they work, which is good for me, that keeps me alive. I mean, I as a scientist, this is a fantastic area with lots of open questions to ask. Today I have told you only about light. But gallium nitride is a material which is fantastic. It's also good for electronics. Not for computers and you know, that kind of stuff, but for high power, high frequency, radio frequency electronics. You will, even now, maybe in your mobile phone, the last power amplifier <coughs> stage is the gallium nitride stage already. But give another five years, your microwave oven, which is still a vacuum tube, a klystron tube, which is this big, will be replaced by a tiny gallium nitride. Gallium nitride devices will work at 800 degrees centigrade, no problem. They are very, very robust. Okay, that's a completely that's a different talk. Before I end, I want to tell you two things. One is a little bit about what we do at TIFR. So, uh, we work on growing these materials by a process called epitaxy, which means depositing things layer by layer or atom by atom, whatever you want. We work on making the materials and we make devices. We make devices not because we want to make the world's best device, but the device helps us understand the material. And to connect the dots, in the middle is something called spectroscopy. We shine light on the material and see what it tells us. We try and understand the band structure, we try and understand energy levels, etc. This is what my lab looks like. We are like kids, we like toys to play with, except for me, my toy is 5 crores. Uh, <laughs> so this is the machine in which we grow our gallium nitride. This part is all chemical engineering. It's valves and you know meters and everything else to uh, deliver controlled amounts of materials inside a reactor which sits over here, which is where you heat up something to 1000 degrees. Okay, what do we do? We don't start with gallium and nitrogen. We start off with ammonia which is nitrogen with three hydrogens on it. And we start off with an organic molecule, trimethyl gallium. Gallium with three methyl groups on it. You pass controlled amounts of them inside this, you heat it up, the three methyl groups break up, the ammonia breaks up, the hydrogens and the methyl become methane and go away, and you have gallium and nitrogen that form gallium nitride. Okay, there are 200 reactions that happen in the middle, but this is the summary of the story. <laughs> so this is what I do on this. And... Uh, uh, we have intentionally not kept our reactor in a clean room. Uh, only the, the, this, the, the main part sits inside a little glove box, uh, which has three hands, in case there are 300 people. Uh, and uh, uh, we can, of course, make these LED structures. We can make transistors. We can make ultraviolet detectors. Uh, this is the show and tell kind of stuff. Uh, but really what excites me is, uh, for example, I can grow gallium nitride. Remember I tell that the problem is the substrate. We figure out that there are other materials you can grow it on. For example, molybdenum sulfide. We can grow it on graphene. Graphene is a single sheet of carbon atoms. right? And if you grow it on graphene, you can somehow peel it off and transfer it to a uh, plastic sheet and make flexible devices. So you can transfer off this gallium nitride and put it on a plastic. Uh, what you see like grass over here is gallium nitride grass. It's a million times smaller. That's a uh, micron. Uh, so imagine your hair is about 70 microns. Uh, this is about 70 times smaller in diameter than your hair. It's like grass. I can pick one of these up. I can. Uh, uh, this is the red. It's false color here. This is the red wire you see over here. Uh, this is 70 nanometer diameter. It's stuck at two ends and balanced above like a bridge. So this is like a little guitar string. I can pluck it and see how it vibrates and study how this not sound, but it's vibrating in the megahertz range because it's so small. Uh, study the, the the mechanics of it uh, when it vibrates. I can do fun stuff with this. Uh, Okay, so I am, yeah, I am done with my time, but if you give me five minutes, maybe even less, I am going to tell you a little bit about the economics. I said economics is important. So should we, we can jump or we can do economics for two minutes. Let us, let us do economics. So, as I said, science is not the determinant of whether society accepts something, it is economics. And I have two questions to ask. One is, what is the cost of light? What is the cost of light for somebody who is in a city like Mumbai with skyscrapers and lighting everywhere? What is versus somebody who is still dependent on flames for light? And the other question is, how energy efficient is the light that we use? Okay? And these two things are actually linked, somehow. So this is not my work. This is work by Jeff Sau at Sandia Labs, who has done a very, very detailed analysis of this. In the last 300 years, we have been able to make light very, very efficiently. This is the efficiency, whether it is chemical energy going to light or electrical energy going to light, 
this is a logarithmic scale. So every one of these derivatives is a factor 10, 10 times better. So oil lamps by themselves are very, very poor. They're less than 0.1% efficient. Okay. You can get almost a 10 times improvement by not using the fire to get the light, but make something hot that emits light, which is your Petromax, your mantle. Right? You find something that glows white hot and use that to emit light. Okay. So that's the gas mantle. Uh, the initial electric bulk, just the carbon filament itself is almost better than that. Tungsten gives you another order of magnitude improvement, 10 times better. The tungsten bulk, of course, doesn't do much over the last 100 years. Right? But it's still about 5% efficient only. As I said, the tube light gives you another jump of 10 times. So tube lights are almost 40% efficient, 20% efficient. And now you have the LEDs that are coming up, going up to about 50% efficiency or more. This is <coughs> power conversion efficiency. But the equally important point is how much light do we use? And this is where is uh, the thing. Now lighting, I'm going to use light hopefully to improve my productivity, to do useful work, to work at night, whatever. Not because I just want to waste power. Okay, a visit to a mall will tell you otherwise. But this. <laughs> uh, so this, it's a little bit complex, but just, just let me walk you through this. On this y-axis, again, it's a logarithmic scale. It's how much light we consume every year. They use, you consume electricity, you get a bill for kilowatt hours, right? This is mega lumen hours per year. Mega lumen hours per year. And this axis is something which is some fudge factor which depends on the GDP of the country divided by the cost of light. And we have data for the last again 300 years. So this is UK in, 19, in 1700, this is oil lamps, okay? Going up, UK 1850 gas lamps, UK 1900 electricity is just coming in. This is electric bulbs, UK 1950. This is UK data. This is the undeveloped world in 1999, which is still mostly fire. Um, China in 1993, which is again electric bulbs. Developed world 2005, China is moving up there. UK 2000, US 2001, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea. Projections for the world in 2013. All this lies on the same straight line. What this tells you is the following. As, remember, the sources of light are not the same. We have made huge improvements in efficiency of light. As we improve the efficiency of light, we don't save energy. We just use more light. Okay? You can see the same thing. This is what I showed you. If you look at the cost of, of, of energy, the amount of energy we use, so that was better lumen hours per year. This is better watt equivalent hours per year. It's the same thing. Slight slope is slightly different. Lighting uses about 1% of the GDP and 6.5% of the world's energy. And it has done that ever since, regardless of the technology you had. So the moral of the story is the following. The moral of the story is, it's like cars. Cars get more fuel efficient. Do you save petrol? No, you just drive more. <laughs> right? Or you get stuck in a jam, one of them. <laughs> okay, so it's like light. As we give you more sources of light, the LED might be very efficient. Will it help you save energy? Probably not. You just have a brighter world. Okay. So, uh, uh, summary is this. The white LEDs are a key to efficient solid state lighting and they're all based on this blue LED. Blue plus yellow gives you white. And the master of enlightenment, Amano Kasaki, they figured out that you need to put this bad quality buffer layer in the middle and that'll help you eventually get a good quality mechanism. They figured out the first way of pre doping it. But they did lots of other things which I didn't talk about today. Nakamura, of course, finally figured out easier ways of doing it, easier way of activating it to make tea by heating it, and making it a commercial reality that today you can go in a shop and buy an LED. Okay? So this is it. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. And if you have questions, I'm happy to take them as well. It was pretty really interesting. Um, in terms of consumption, they, they probably did the same research on transistors, where they found that you know the power of the transistors has reduced 30 x, but the uh, you know electricity consumption in terms of the US has went up 50 percent in the last 10 years. What is it having sort of? I mean, you know, coming from that economics part, which is interesting. What do you really suggest? It's the, the same trend is true for light as well as power in the devices. What is it that you really suggest that, you know, I mean, or, or, or your vision in the future, what can happen? Other than, of course, the world becomes brighter. Uh, so, of course, if you're asking me to make bold predictions, I'm willing to do that. So, if you can look at the transistors, transistors are actually a very nice thing because it actually uh, 
you know, they, they, they figured out that they're going to hit this problem. You can't keep making devices smaller, it'll eventually become an atom in size. Um, and uh, the fact that static power consumption is going up so much that uh, you're almost reaching the nuclear reactor kind of power levels in every chip. So even if you see any chip now, the fan is bigger than the chip. Uh, so people figured it out. If you look at the last five years, there have not been, you know, we haven't made, we are, we are moving away from this conventional wisdom of packing more transistors onto a chip. What we do is we, you have now quad core and octa core and everything else, you're spreading it out. Uh, the, the main thing today is power dissipation. So the, the entire paradigm of chip design has changed to look at trying to make power dissipation the key thing to optimize and not necessarily performance and speed. Um, the other thing is, we are also moving away from, we are moving to sort of uh, devices which, uh, you, you know, it's not so much that you do computing with a computer. You have lots of small devices which have enough, you know, processor power in it. There could be a tiny sensor sitting on a wall somewhere which is going to work out something and communicate in RFID or whatever it is. So, uh, we are also moving to very, very different models of how devices are going to communicate with each other. Uh, and I believe in light, uh, we will eventually see something like that happen in the sense that, um, you know, either we are going to be sourced, either we will find a way of, you know, getting hydrogen or whatever else and solve the, the, the fact that we have flows to infinite energy, but I don't think that's going to happen very easily. But eventually the energy crisis will hit us so bad that we will figure out that we can't live on that line forever. Just like eventually moved off Moore's law, we'll move off that line. Okay. I might be completely wrong. Yeah, go ahead. So I want to ask that uh, what, how are the laser diodes different from light emitting diodes and uh, how can we transform them into a uh, weapon? Like China has done alpha laser diode. So what are they? Can you please explain us? Um, okay, we'll talk about the weapon in a First, the difference between a laser diode and an LED, not much, not much, but very much. The material is the same. It's the same PN junction stack with something in the middle, the correct kitchen, whatever else you make. In, a, in an LED, you do nothing special. Once you've grown this material like I showed you, you break it up into small bits, put a wire on this side, a wire on that side, and you're done. It emits light in all directions. In a laser, you need a mirror. You need to make a cavity, you put two mirrors, parallel mirrors and you form a cavity that will allow the light to bounce back and forth because in order to get stimulation, stimulated emission to dominate, you need a very high photon density, you need a lot of density of light. And it's very easily done in semiconductors because most of, not gallium right? Most of the materials like gallium arsenide, they, are, they have a cubic crystal shape. So if I just cleave it, it naturally cleaves on crystal planes which can form mirrors. Um, about weapons, uh, there's science fiction. You know, we've had, we've thought of, we've thought of weapons. Uh, well, I mean, there are practical weapons and there are science fiction weapons. So, the practical weapons for laser diodes, the advantage is it's a small thing, I carry it in my pocket, you can make what I call dazzlers. A dazzler is something that, uh, which, which dazzles, uh, you know, seekers. I mean, you have people who are trying to locate you, you kind of blind them out by <laughs> shining light on them. Laser shooting down missiles or not, Science fiction. Lasers from space, the problem is, and people figure it out. If you have a laser in space, you need a megawatt class continuous wave operating laser. You can do it with gas lasers or whatever else. The problem is, how do you put a megawatt class generator up there? Okay, so people use chemical lasers. Okay, you get a megawatt beam. The air is so turbulent, you know, stars, stars twinkle, your laser beam tends to drift, drift around. So, what do you do with that? And then finally, they figured that when you aim the laser beam on somebody's house, all he needs to do is put two inches of water on the house, on the roof, the laser will boil the water. I mean, you know, if at all you got to that point. So, I mean, uh, it, it's not even the thing about, the big thing is not making, I can make you megawatts of power, that's not a problem. Delivering the beam to target is a big challenge. And astronomers know the way to do it because they use these uh, deformable mirrors and Correct. Sir, some cases have come that uh, when somebody puts a laser diode on the aeroplane, flying plane, it uh, reflects the light in the, inside the cockpit and uh, it gets very blurred to the pilot's image. Uh, you, you must have gone for a movie show where people are playing around with lasers. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun to get somebody poking a laser in your eye. I mean, in a movie theater, it doesn't matter when you're flying a plane, it's a little bit more important. So it's not a good thing to do. Don't, don't shine lasers at me. Yeah, this is great. And uh, first thing is, uh, you know, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And uh, it was really enlightening. And it was superb. And 
the question is this, uh, can you just uh, touch upon uh, LED bulbs which is coming in the market and uh, correlate what uh, with respect to the diode? And uh, second thing is that, uh, can you just tell us, uh, you know, uh, where are we in, uh, uh, in this research and also in the possibly uh, Prime Minister's telling about the main thing about Bait in India, very different points, where are we uh, as uh, in India with respect to this LED? We as in India? Uh -huh. Okay, first thing, what's an LED bulb now? What, what, what I should do is, this was very cool, right? Yes. Now, what you didn't see was there's a... Uh, remember I said it's a low voltage device, I'm going to convert 240 volts somehow to this. So, this is effectively, a, it's, a, it's like a laptop charger, it's a battery, it's, it's converting this to uh, about 20 volts or so. Uh, in an LED bulb, what you do is you combine this and this and you put it in a shape of a bulb so you can screw it in the same socket. That's effectively what an LED bulb is, nothing, nothing much more than this. Um, the commercially, in India, unfortunately, it's zero. Uh, there was one company that tried to get set up, but to the best of my knowledge, it's bankrupt. Um, the problem is, uh, this is an extremely materials in, in intensive thing. We don't have any source of sapphire in India, we don't have any source of trimethyl volume in India, we don't have any source of ammonia, you have fertilizer grade ammonia. But semiconductors require extreme levels of purity. Uh, so you have to import even a cylinder of ammonia. And to make life easier, every cylinder you import, you need clearance from the controller of explosives sitting in Nagpur. Okay. For them, for many, many years, a cylinder had to be made of steel. Ultra pure gases were shipped in aluminum cylinders and aluminum wasn't defined to be a cylinder. So, you know, uh, for us, we for one cylinder, we, we need it for research, we get some exemption, something. Most of these materials cannot ship on a plane. You cannot transport them on a plane. They have to come by sea freight. Uh, it's very difficult to set up a commercially viable thing in India if you want to make profit out of it because it's just not geared for you. Whereas China has 500, I mean, the, the blue Dubai you saw, which I worked with, that was the first system in India. Now there are seven or eight labs with the same capability, um, which is good uh, because we missed the gallium arsenide and other materials. At least gallium nitride research wise in India, we're doing very well. Uh, China has probably 500 companies, each with 100 such machines, growing things 24/7. So I think there's no way we can we can compete commercially. You need economies of scale. However, what I said, not the white LED, which is a mass market product, forget it. But UV LEDs, it's still an open game. Electronic devices, still an open game, and most of these are for radar and other things, which people won't sell you anyway. So you might as well develop the technology and then start selling it. And today, I think in IISC, for example, they're growing some fantastic quality materials and they made some very good devices. Um, you you might see devices, these niche market things coming up in India. <coughs> okay, was that? Yeah, here. So, uh, uh, what is a quantum competing and what kind of material would be required to make it? Okay, this is not related to the talk at all. Uh, but I'll give you the very short answer to it. Uh, normal computing we do with bits, which are ones and zeros, right? In quantum computing, you use uh, you use something which are not bits with ones and zeros, but something called quantum bits, which can take many states between one and zero in some sort of mixture of states. It allows you to do computation in a very different manner, which is potentially more efficient and faster. Allows you to solve problems which a classical computer cannot do. Um, what do you make it out of? We don't know as yet. Uh, some people think that you can make it out of uh, spins of atoms. Some people think you can make it out of superconducting circuits. Some people think you can make it out of nitrogen vacancies in diamond. So lots of people doing it. So far, I think you know more than making six or seven such bits and doing something has not progressed very much to a practical level. But a lot of people are working on it. Might be a big break. Because whatever this uh, LED lights are there, you could not stare that LED light. Whereas uh, in fluorescent light, you can stare. But uh, the problem is like uh, in this, uh, whether we can increase that uh, whatever the illumination is there. Okay, okay. So I mean, so that which is uh, not uh, comfortable for you. No, I, I mean, you can't. I can't stare at that also for very long. Uh, that's a halogen lamp. Yeah, yeah. And even a CFL, you can't stare at it for very long. I don't recommend you stare at these things. See, remember a, a tube light, you are distributing the, the energy coming out over a large area. Right? It's a long cylinder which is emitting the light. And the cylinder folded up with your CFL. 
Here the light is being emitted from, this is one of the problems in getting LEDs to be used. Uh, if you want to illuminate the room, this is fantastic if you want to make a torch. Right? If you want to spread the light out, how do you do it? So uh, getting the light out of the LED in a wide angle is something which requires a lot of effort. Um, so I mean, the idea is the LED is not designed for you to look at. Right? It's designed for you to be put in. So you have to put it in an appropriate luminaire which sort of distributes the light, uh, you know, then just focuses it in one place. Sir, what do you think future after LED? Future after LEDs. After LEDs. Means uh, now you see when Alo Edison invented bulb, mm. he might not have imagined that sometimes there might be LED or something. Okay. But now we know that man is just progressing, progressing, progressing. So <coughs> um, I, I don't know, but I think at least for some applications like headlights, uh, these cinema lights or whatever projection lights, uh, it's going to be lasers. Uh, because if you can make a laser, it's much more efficient. Uh, if you can get red plus blue plus green lasers together, you can basically have a white color of laser light. So it will be lasers it, for something, but it may not be for illuminating your house. But what I think is the future for home illumination is not these, as he said, it's too bright. You can have these LEDs, they require first thing a 10 crore dabba on which you make it. Uh, you make this on sapphire wafers of this size. If you could get plastics to emit light, it may not be that efficient. But if plastics are cheap to make, you can make you know, rolls of plastics. May not be very efficient, but just imagine you have a sheet on your wall which glows dimly. But the whole wall is glowing and emitting light. So something like this might be might be the future. As of now, plastics are not very stable. They degrade very soon, so that's the problem. Thank you, sir. Which are the potential places of for research in these topics in India? Which are the potential places for research? Uh, as, in, as in universities and labs? Um, Let's see, if you want to work on growth of LEDs, if you want to work on just the semiconductor theory, you can do it anywhere. If you want to work on these uh, places where you can grow these materials and make devices, uh, TIFR, IIC, JNC, Anna University, CAT Indore, uh, Solid State Physics Lab Delhi, NPL Delhi, uh, Kolkata University Nanoscience Center, IIT Madras, IIT Bombay, um, IIT Jodhpur is planning to get into this. I mean, it's increasing by the day, so a lot of places. Chemistry part of it. Chemistry part of it. <coughs> uh, I, I, for me, physics and chemistry are very artificial divisions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Am I, am I a what, what, did I did I do physics or chemistry in this? I don't know. I mean, I did science, so <laughs> I, I don't think it really matters. Uh, we've, we've, uh, these Nobel laureates propose that they it has been proposed that gallium nitride would emit blue light. So how do they predict that gallium nitride would you know, produce this type of light? Oh, they didn't, I mean, the point, uh, so you don't need to do uh, chemistry for it. I mean, basic, uh, even even if you just do semiconductor theory, if you know, the, um, which is physics, chemistry, whatever you call it, if you know the strength of the aluminum nitrogen bond, and you know what kind of crystal structure it will form, you can predict what kind of light it will emit. Uh, that's, whether it's, whether dealing with the aluminum nitrogen bond is physics or chemistry, I think that's